Just under 800 years ago, in the midst of a dark and bleak Icelandic winter tale was written down. The tale had already been told for a hundred of years. It discussed myths and monsters, but great and now, as a result of the revolutionary new literary tradition sweeping through Iceland, it would be recorded in its current state and an austerity from Greenland to the United States throughout the Vikings. The world was open until the 12th century. The story has been memorized by one one generation of poets after another. It is becoming one of the most popular and the most enduring of all stories that is still going on. The saga of Ragnar Lodbrok is being retold today, but is there any truth to this? Let us investigate. In the year 814, Great King Charlemagne, ruler of the largest empire in Western Europe since the fall of Rome. In the wake of his death, a once prosperous realm soon devolved into in a civil war between his descendants in some of the other states that filled the void left by the Romans, such as in Visigothic Spain and Gothic Austria. In Italy, the Roman tradition of giving one son's hereditary inheritance had this was not to be the case as for the Franks. They continued their ancient tradition of diving up an inheritance between sons, a tradition that had plagued them for centuries when finally the dust from the succession settled. Charlemagne's hard work was settled. It had been undone largely through the actions of his own descendants. Three distinct kingdoms were born on the one East Francia, the state was on the other side. That would eventually go on to become Germany. I was loitering in the middle, a realm, which would eventually be absorbed by the other two kingdoms in the west. However, in the original heartlands of the Franks along the Atlantic coast, the hinterlands of Gaul, where West Francia and the kingdom that would eventually become. It was here under the rule of Louis the Pius and his descendants, Charles the Bald, discovered a new distinctive a lack of centralized power would be increasingly capitalized upon by a new power. The Franks had pushed ever since onwards to the pagan north to conquer new lands and bring in more people, Christian fold and now a reckoning. They first arrived. There are only a few boats attempting their luck. But as the years dragged on, ever increasing piratical sea waves, the raiders came flooding down from the unforgiving north of the Viking Age had begun. Frankish sources of the time. I mention Horik, the king of the Danes. There's most likely only one Danish king among many, being undercut by West Frankish king Louis de Pius, who had supported a herald's Horik's rival, claiming to the Horik's throne, clang and struggled to overthrow him. Whilst this divide and rule policy is in effect, it might have worked under a strong hand. Charlemagne, whose elite army might, they have made light work of the piratical newcomers from the north, had slipped over the years and at Frankish, the army was now a mere shadow of what it had once been. After Horik successfully fought off the attacks with full ferocity from his adversary, one of the Nordmen was about to come, catastrophically crashing down upon Louis' head first in the form of a small fleet and later in the form of a powerful and powerful warlord who would destroy his way into the scene over the coming years. If the legends and stories were later told, even bears any resemblance to his life to tell the truth, he was one of the first examples of a sea king during the Viking Age is certainly one of the most memorable. Ragnar Lodbrok had arrived. Since the end of the Saxon Wars of the late in the 18th century, Scandinavian raids have been conducted. Frankly, those wars had been a long and drawn out conflict against the inhabitants of Old Saxony, are still pagan land immediately to the south of they ended up in the police force. Much of that's conversion. It was after 30 years that the inhabitants arrived. The long evangelized crusade that the Franks first came into direct contact with the inhabitants of Denmark. Though the reputation of the Franks had it almost certainly preceded them as well. As the emperor lived, Jura remained largely safe, according to Charlemagne's biographer Einhard. I'm writing just a handful of years later. The only places looted and sacked during its lifetime. Certain islands off the coast of Frisia, as close to the German border coast, he even established coast guard squadrons, guard to defend the river systems after with his death. All this was to change with no strong-handed, powerful ruler to lead it. Charlemagne's empire quickly unraveled. And within just a few years, the Danes moved in like carrion to pick at the corpse. Opportunistic squadrons of three or four throughout the 80s. Ships became more common. 
They encounter 10th and 820s significant success through remote raiding and light populated areas on the peripheries of the West Frankish. These, however, fleets began to consist of tens of vessels, and as the words of they discovered they were increasingly successful, they tested their luck against larger and they took the silver. In 837, Kieran Horwick seems to have disapproved of the raids, which he publicly condemned in letters to Charlemagne's successor, Louis. For the peers this could easily have, could have been a ruse. It does suggest that in reality, King Horik held little power over the increasingly rambunctious and ambitious Danish warlords. In 845, an entirely new breed of army arrived on the continent. Not just tens of vessels, but a fleet of hundreds crammed full, with up to 5,000 Vikings warriors. Where did this fleet come from? It's anyone's guess, but according to the Frankish sources, it was led by a man. A man named Rex Harris. A man who a number of modern scholars associate the most famous Viking of all, Runvar Ragnar's son Lodbrok. A number of Sarkis relate to the tales of Ragnar's early life, yet the vast, the majority of these are likely to be later. Additions made as the story of his legends and deeds became inflated over time. Especially if a large number of later warlords claimed descent from him and would have wanted to inflate their much like he himself. Apparently, he claimed to have been direct descendant, as did the majority of Danish kings and queens. His warlords at the time, including Horik, 12th century runic overlord inscriptions in Orkneys to the 13th century Icelandic sagas. Ragnar became nothing short of a god. In the centuries after his death, to be honest, if anything of his in relation to as if the sagas had any truth to them, Ragnar himself would probably be quite amused by these later stories that grew up around him nevertheless. Whether he whether they wore magical hairy trousers or not, the Ragnar who landed in Frankish territory coastline commanded a huge force of warriors, over 5,000 Vikings, if the Frankish sources are to be believed at all. Around 100 people who were crammed aboard, whether or not they had been with Horik sent in directly or not the Danish king was about to have spectacular performance. In revenge against the Franks, it is without a doubt one of the most colorful Horik's court members. Ragnar's surname allegedly stemmed from he wore the cohout trousers that he wore into if the story is to be told believed. He claimed it offered him magical protection against enemies according to the old Nord sagas, which are quasi-historical at the very best, and pure myth a lot of the time. Especially during this early period, made his magical trousers by boiling subsequently employed. He used them to win his second wife's Aslak by she defeated a serpent that guarded her. Specifically, because he was one of the earliest sea kings to ravage Europe, Ragnar Lodbrok was a real person. Historical characters and scholars today. He will still rigorously debate the issue. Genuine historical accomplishments have been obscured over time, over the centuries. Stories have been told to fill in the gaps gaps in his life as genuine events. His still was embellished so much that is even so, it would remain largely a fantasy if he was indeed a real historical figure. But this seemed to be the real Ragnar Lodbrok, where there are no other major pirates like those who had arrived before him. He was one of the very first instances of a sea king or a seaborne ruler, sufficient in his own right to launch his own autonomous attacks, seize lands for himself and his family, followers on foreign shores. Or Ragnar had most likely been in Francia since the 1830s and 841. He was granted land in Frisia, but King Charles the Bald probably had a bulwark against other Viking raiders. After a few years, however, he lost these lands as well as his favor with the king. In 845, he entered the river sand at the head of a huge host, the largest to hit Francia. But in an era when armies, they usually numbered hundreds of men, French sources claim that Ragnar's force numbered 5,000. They sacked Ruin and made off with a huge amount of wealth before heading further south, towards the capital, where they systematically plundered of the fertile lands. Like his predecessor and their descendants, Ragnar only fought when the odds were stacked against his. But the gods tended to favor him. He launched terrorizing blitzkrieg tactics demoralizing and outnumbering opponents before they could muster a strong enough force to oppose him. Determined to not to allow the invaders to sack the royal, Saint Denis Abbey of St. Charles assembled his 
He split his army into two parts, one of which he led, placed on either side of the river. A shrewd tactician Ragnar simply attacked. The smaller army wipes it out in full. View of their helpless comrades, on the other hand, what could Frankish warrior accomplish? He did nothing but watch as just over a hundred the survivors were sacrificed to Odin. The horrified defenders of the city could do little but wait for the eventual Viking attack. At the time, Paris was situated on a little island in the river Sand. Fortified with strong defenses though, isolated as it was, it was perfect, suited for a Viking blockade and attack. On March 29th, Easter Sunday, almost it was certainly a date picked on purpose in order to demoralize the already terrified locals. Ragnar's men arrived and plundered the outskirts of the city, but before long, disease began to spread. Ragnar's encampment, which his position was significantly weakened as a result of his terms, were eventually offered and Charles begrudgingly consented to paying approximately 6,000 pounds for gold and silver to get Ragnar and his men to leave. This was the very first of at least 13 payments of Danish geld. They paid over a century to come to get it. Frankia's response to Viking raiders. Peacefully, while Charles was heavily, he was just sides for his payment. Bigger fish for his brothers to fry. His grundled nobles and regional rivals all threatened to stamp out his position. At any time, he preferred to try to get the Vikings, arguably the least of his concerns at the time, to leave. Peacefully, if at all possible, Grunvar Ragnar's son, he agreed to withdraw from Paris. Though he, it seems he had pillaged several sites, he was on his way home. Up in his arrival, he will most likely go to Denmark. He allegedly showed the wealth he had acquired by King Horik and boasted about. He knew how easy the attack had been, though they also mentioned that the only resistance they had met the long deceased Saint Germain of Paris, who believed he sent plague that had torn through his camp. However, shortly after Wagner's return, the king of East Francia, Louis the German, had apparently forced his overlordship over the Danes, as it was most likely. Only a few southerners thought this, prompted Horok to execute many of the men who had been responsible for a Paris raid and recaptured their plunder to return to the Franks, along with a whole host of other reasons. This is especially true in an economic and societal terms. One possibility is to crack down on raiders. The reason why so many Scandinavians left at this point is to arrive in other Viking settlements across the North Sea, searches in Ireland and Scotland Isles. Ragnar, meanwhile, had apparently already left by this point, embarking on a piratical career that remains impossible. To disentangle himself from the mists of legends, he then may have gone raiding into the Irish Sea back to Frankrike, or most famously of all, he may have raided into Northumbria, despite the fact that he allegedly fought the king. Hela wouldn't become king there. Horik was born in 854 and died in the mid-860s. He was killed by one of his nephews and the exiles from the Paris raid, apparently. They were allowed to return home, though Rain, Harris or Ragnar are never seen or heard from again. Again, in the Frankish sources, the, there are stories, are bound for his eventually demise. He was allegedly killed during a botched operation, attack on the Isle of Anglesey. He died in a civil war between Danes and Norsemen off the coast of Ireland's most famous of all. However, as the tale says that he was shipwrecked off the English coast, was battered by a storm and was captured by Ayla, the Northumbrian king, who in cruel punishments against the Old Sea, the king had him thrown into a pit of snakes. According to one telling of the tale, his famous trousers protected him from the finally the disgruntled English king. He had to pull his foe out of the pit to have them removed before throwing him back in the Viking raiders. Paris in the year 8080. This time another of the most prominent a famous Viking in history was a sea king. In reality there is no relation to Gronvar Ragnarsson. At one of the great turning points in the history of France and potentially one of the largest sieges of the Vikings age. A huge force of many hundreds, the ships were finally repelled in 886. By this time, much of Britain had already fell under the sway of the Vikings. According to legend, time passes under a brood of brothers who, according to a number of traditions, call themselves the son of Ragnar. According to the tale, the Ragnar Lodbrok written down at some point, meat was used to tell stories in the 13th century. For centuries, Halls from Dublin to Kiev have before Ragnar had several sons, all legendary sea kings in their own rights, according to the saga. As he was dying in Elis snake bit Ragnar, made a well known in relation to these sons. When they hear the names of these sons of Ragnar was indeed an illustrious figure. 
Ivar the Boneless, perhaps the king for a time. Dublin was the progenitor of it was famous for terrorizing a dynasty. The Irish Sea for centuries to come. Bjorn Ironside, raider of the Lost Ark Mediterranean, was later said to have retired to Sweden. Oba, the Duke of the Frisians, was a participant in the invasion of Britain in the 1860s. Halfdan Ragnarsson, one of the first kings of Vikings, occupied Northumbria, and Secret Snake in the Eye was created by a well known sorceress. Warriors in their own right, all in all. It is highly unlikely that it is descended from upon hearing of Ragnar in the sagas. Their father's dead, Ivar and Abba both swore to cross the sea to avenge him. He was playing chess and when he told the news he gripped the piece so hard, his nails bled the impending danger. This invasion is known to us today as the Great Heathen Army. The legend of the Cracker Mouth was most likely created in the Scottish Isles in the 12th century. Ragnar's legendary status when it records his last words. Songa's sound was in as if the snakes of Elis pits were circling in. It gladdens me to know the builders. My father prepares the benches for I will be drinking ale soon. From curved horns, the champions who come in the Odin's dwelling. Valhalla does not lament his death. I will not enter his domain. With fearful words on my lips, I entered the hall. Aesir will welcome me when death comes. I'm eager to leave without lamenting. The desire summoned me home. Those sent by Odin to find the Valkyries from the halls of the Lord's hosts. I'm gladly drank ale in the highlands. Seat with a seer. The days of my life are at end. I laugh as I die. And that was the actual story of Ragnar Lothrock. Drop a like if you like this and comment what you like most about the story of the real Ragnar Lothrock. Also click the video you see on screen right now to keep on watching stories about legendary Viking warriors.